Um, okay, so I took the, the theme of, of this year's TED quite seriously, uh, and then I imagined um, an email uh, that I captured from the future. It is an email to my son about 10 years from now, uh, which offers up sort of a cautionary tale about a possible future for the internet. Just happened to have this email from the future here, and I will read it to you. Okay, so here goes. Dear Matthew, this is the last email I will ever send. No, I'm not sick, I'm not dying, but I'm afraid the internet can't say the same thing. People no longer trust that the internet will behave the way it was intended, and no, planes aren't falling out of the sky, nuclear power plants aren't exploding, cyber robots aren't enslaving humans, but there is a pernicious set of forces at work on the internet that have slowly but surely undermined our trust. Let me give you some examples. There are occasional unexplained power outages. They aren't long in duration, but they are completely unpredictable and very disruptive. Traffic lights are unreliable, leading to accidents and needless congestion. And again, not always, but at seemingly all the wrong times. The theft of intellectual property out of computer networks has reached completely unacceptable heights, and we truly are witnessing a global and substantial measurable transfer of wealth. Companies, products, and jobs are springing up in places that aren't where the ideas were invented. Uh, in addition, many companies have gone bankrupt due to a cyber breach, and there are strange, unexplained incidents uh, that affect a company's stock price uh, in unexpected ways. Identity theft and repeat identity theft are at an all-time high. Uh, people are just simply fed up. Uh, I have no confidence that any communication that I have on the internet will be confidential. My emails and those of many others have been sent to people that were not the intended recipients. Uh, yes, this will be the last email I will ever send to you or anybody else. Uh, in fact, I have no idea if you'll even get this email, so I'll, I'll stop here in a moment. Um, <clears throat> I'm writing up some notes as to why I think cyberspace has become a bad neighborhood and uh, what could have been done to prevent it. When I'm done, I'll send a hard copy to you in the U.S. mail. Uh, I'll be interested in your reaction. I suppose a little good news in this is that the U.S. mail system is thriving. <clears throat> The, the hard copy uh, uh, mail business is booming again. Uh, hope you and the family are well. Love, Dad. P.S., your mother's birthday is next week. If you, if you forget to call her to wish her happy birthday, I'm going to make you watch videos of yourself when you were in high school. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> okay, so that's the letter. So let's, let's snap back to the present. So I, uh, <clears throat> I referenced in my email that I had a few notes that I was sending him that that basically talked about you know, what, what sort of happened and what, what, what could we have done to pre prevent that sort of bad scenario. So I don't know exactly what I'll say, but I, I just sort of imagine what was I likely to say uh, in, in, the, in those hard copy notes. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> I think I would have talked about the fact that uh, weaknesses are exploited. The inventors of the internet were absolutely brilliant to come up with a technology and an infrastructure that um, allowed billions and billions of users is really a remarkable thing. Uh, that said, the internet is fundamentally insecure. It just simply wasn't designed for security. It was designed for collaboration among trusted individuals, and as a result, there are known uh, vulnerabilities in the network that are being exploited today, and I'm imagining in the future they continue to be exploited. Software. <clears throat> Software is vulnerable. Um, there are these, you know, you can basically think of it as there are these holes in software that, that hackers can sort of crawl through in order to compromise a system. Um, <clears throat> the software manufacturers issue software patches 
Uh, unfortunately, many times people don't, don't bother to install the patches. Um, you, might, you might think hardware is secure. Well, it, it turns out even hardware isn't secure. There are known vulnerabilities that, that hackers can exploit. And then finally, I've listed there something about human weaknesses. Um, uh, humans have, have frequently been called the weakest link in security, and there, there are techniques known as social engineering um, that basically uh, have, that the attackers basically try to trick you into taking an action that will compromise your computer. I'm, ex I'm expecting that that has, has been flourishing over the, over the next 10 years uh, to that email. <clears throat> I think I would have also talked about the fact that there, are, there aren't enough trained defenders. So right today, there is this huge skills gap between the number of people we have and the number of people we need. There was one study from a couple of years ago that basically talked about the fact that there are uh, approximately 1,000 elite cyber defenders that can kind of take on the most sophisticated cyber adversaries. Uh, unfortunately, we need way more than that. We need something like you know, 10 to 30 times that, that number. Uh, it sort of starts from the fact that there aren't enough trained STEM people to, to, to kind of build from. Uh, one of the speakers earlier this morning kind of talked about that. <clears throat> and, and then from that, uh, not enough of them went into cybersecurity. By the way, I spoke at TEDx Kids yesterday and, and did my best to recruit some middle schoolers uh, into the field. We'll, we'll see how I did in 10 years from now. <clears throat> and then, you know, basically sort of year after year after year, um, it just sort of got worse. Um, cyberspace is fundamentally an environment that favors the attacker. And then year after year, if, uh, you know, if there just aren't enough defenders, um, slowly but surely, the attackers basically kind of overwhelmed the defenders, and I suspect that that's what have happened uh, over the course of, that, uh, of those 10 years to the email. <clears throat> um, we, we didn't create a, a science of cybersecurity. <clears throat> so cybersecurity has been referred to by many as a wicked problem. Um, it's not wicked because it's evil necessarily, but it's wicked because um, it's been extremely resilient to a ready solution. Um, the, uh, research in, in computer security kind of dates back for 40 years or so, over 40 years. So we've been, we've been studying this, this problem for, uh, you know, for a long time, um, but you know, we, we clearly don't have uh, solutions that we can offer up. <clears throat> um, th th there is no product, there is no service you can offer that will, will solve this problem, so there, there is really no easy button. <clears throat> the field in general is, is far too reactive and after the fact. Uh, basically, something bad has to happen, and then people jump into action. Well, that might work sort of in the short term, but with that strategy, you sort of never get ahead of the problem. Um, and then, you know, sort of over the course of these 10 years, the problem just got farther and farther and farther ahead of us, and we could, we could never catch up. <clears throat> uh, science uses words like, like data and metrics and replication and prediction. Uh, those words aren't used nearly enough in the field. Um, <clears throat> we, we don't have good metrics, um, we, we can't replicate phenomena, and we certainly can't predict things very well. Um, about the only thing we can predict with confidence is that a determined hacker will likely compromise uh, the intended system. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to now turn just for a couple of minutes uh, into some research that's taking place in our lab at SMU that I think uh, are really nice examples of the kinds of things I'm talking about here in the creation of a science of cybersecurity. There are some bright spots ahead, and some of the things we're doing at SMU I think are, are good signals for that. Uh, the first one comes out of, uh, out of the lab of one of our professors, a gentleman by the name of Tyler Moore. <clears throat> He's been understanding machine disease. He's been studying sick web servers. So it turns out there are these machines called web servers that basically offer up services on the web, and to the extent that they are sick, um, makes part of today's internet sort of a bad neighborhood. <clears throat> um, it turns out that there are a large number of these, of these un unsafe websites today. Uh, on any given week, there may be as, as many as 30 to 50 to 90,000 brand new web servers that are sick. <clears throat> Uh, basically, he's adopted a technique that actually comes from the field of epidemiology. It's really an interesting approach. So epi epidemiologists sort of study human disease, so that they, have the, they study this, this big sample of, of humans. Some of them are sick, some of them are healthy, and they try to understand what are the conditions under which pe some people become sick and some people stay healthy. He adopted the same approach in studying web servers, <clears throat> and he sort of systematically was able to identify um, the factors that underlied what caused a machine to get sick 
and what caused the machine to stay healthy. Really interesting sort of approach and the, the sort of thing we need to do um, going forward. Um, let me give you another quick example. This comes out of the lab of, of Professor Mitch Thornton. Uh, he's been worrying about the hardware problem. <clears throat> um, I, won't, I won't go into the, the details of this. It, it, it ends up being pretty technical. I could talk to you about, you know, 10 to the power of 154 number of search spaces and so forth. But basically, the, the problem in the exploitation of, of, of hardware is, is that it's really difficult to find that there's a problem. So there's um, <clears throat> something malicious going on in hardware, either intentionally or unintentionally, and you have to search through this gigantic search space in order to find it. <clears throat> the search space is just, you know, humongously large, <clears throat> and um, with current approaches, it's just sort of very difficult to detect these problems. So Professor Thornton is working on a technology uh, uh, called model checking, which basically rigorously, scientifically, and mathematically determines whether some security property uh, is, is in existence or not. And it, again, is the, it is the sort of, um, of, of technique that I think we need to do more of by way of creating a, a science of cybersecurity. Okay, <clears throat> let me close with, with one slide here. And that kind of, kind of asked the question, you know, kind of where does that leave us now? Uh, <clears throat> I'm reminded of a, uh, of a speech by Winston Churchill <clears throat> that he gave um, in, uh, in 1942, shortly after the, 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 the British and the Western Allies defeated Rommel in Egypt. And he delivered this really famous speech <clears throat> where he talks about um, now this is not the end. Uh, it is not even the beginning of the end but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. There have been so many uh, uh, hacking attempts, it's just a matter of picking up the newspaper and watching and, and reading. Um, so many people have been affected that now action is being taken, and that's a great thing. A, a number of actions are being taken at, at many levels. That, that is terrific. <clears throat> but then that raises the question, you know, uh, are the right actions being taken? Is enough action being taken? And I do sort of wonder if we're, we're uh, entering sort of a, a, a choice point between a couple of different futures for cyberspace. So the future that I described in my hypothetical email is really a future that isn't one we want. And it's very different than the future we thought about 20 years ago, right? So the, the, the internet is, is a, a relatively new thing. We've been using it for less than 20 years or so. And think back when you started using the internet, you know, we were calling it the information superhighway. It promised all of these capabilities, all of these freedoms that we could, we could operate. And, it's, and if you compared that, that vision from 20 years ago and where we are today, um, it's not exactly the same. So you, you do wonder, you know, are we gonna take the actions that lead us to that vision of the information superhighway or the bad neighborhood? <clears throat> um, you know, as a, as a computer science professor and an academic, uh, I just love the, the, the challenges posed by some of the problems I talked about. You know, these hardware problems, these software problems, they are just fascinating. They're hard, they're, they're challenging, they're long-term, exactly the sorts of things professors like to work on. <clears throat> but at another sort of human and emotional level, um, there's, there are people's lives who are being affected by this. Every time I give talks like this, I have people come up to me afterwards. So I gave a talk yesterday to the middle school group, and a whole bunch of people came up to me afterwards and, and, and talked to me about problems. You know, they've, they've got computers that are hacked, they've got, um, you know, issues that they, they worry about with their online banking and so forth. <clears throat> and I hear these stories, and it, you know, honestly, it sort of breaks my heart to hear some of the things that are happening to really good people. I heard about this one story about an elderly gentleman who basically is having his life ruined. He got caught up in this one particular scam. He, 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 he believed deeply that the scam was actually true, and he, he kept writing checks, um, believing that there would be some big payoff for him. Um, it ended up, he, he basically um, sort of spent down his nest egg. His wife got really mad at him. His wife left him. I mean, and you know, his, his life is just really, really different. So um, you know, on, on the one level, there are these interesting technical, intellectual problems. On another level, there are people whose lives are being affected, and so you know, there's just so many, so many levels to the problem. Um, <clears throat> we are really in, in a marathon and not a sprint. Um, this, this problem is going to be with us, I'm, I'm sorry to say, for quite a while. As I mentioned before, there isn't some piece of software, there isn't some service you can purchase that will make the problem go away. 
we're going to have to live with it for a long time. <clears throat> and as a result, the, 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 the point about you know, kind of raising awareness really is important. <clears throat> so it turns out that, that at the national level, um, uh, October has been deemed National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. <clears throat> so here we are in October, so please consider your awareness raised. <clears throat> I'm kind of, <clears throat> kind of doing my part. But it, but it is the point to say, you know, it's, it's important for people to sort of understand the risks in cyberspace. You know, you, you need to do what you can to defend yourself uh, and all of your devices. <clears throat> um, let me close with, with my, my last little quote there. It's, it's to say, you know, the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time is now. So, you know, I talk about um, the need for taking a long-term approach and developing a science of cybersecurity. Uh, developing a science takes a very long time. It, it's going to take decades. <clears throat> um, the, but the last thing we want is for 20 years from now where we don't have this sort of fundamental understanding of how to defend cyberspace. So we need to start planting some trees now such that, um, you know, in, in 10 years from now, I have the opportunity to send all of you emails. Thank you very much.